The purpose of this is basically for students to tell you what they are planning to do in the next semester. So this is just a proposal. So they are basically saying this is my idea as to what my senior design project will be next semester. Senior design project uh, in our department is divided into two, two different classes. The first class is the basically the project definition. You define what it is that you want to do. You do certain testing in, in order to make sure that the, to do the proof of concept. In the second part, you actually perform the project design. So the implementation and testing is all going to, all of those are going to be done in the second part of the course. Um, so today, we actually have three different projects. Um, starting now to 1.15 or so, we do the first project. First project is uh, presented by Matt, Matt Hosag. Uh, I believe the title of the project is still a spectral optimization through spatial acoustic monitoring. Um, and uh, Matt is going to present what he's planning to do next semester and um, basically what's the idea, what's the requirements and what it is that he's planning to actually implement. Um, I passed out one of these forms uh, to all the faculties involved uh, in this meeting. I really appreciate your feedback. This is basically how we actually get your ideas, your comments, your feedback regarding the presentation, and this will definitely help us to grade these presentations and the work of the student in much broader and better way. So, I just now present to you, Matt, thank you. optimization through spatioacoustical monitoring, which is really a complicated way of saying that based on a recording that I'm making, I want to be able to optimize the spectrum that I'm picking up based on taking sampling points throughout a whole space. So in order to get you up to speed on what I'm doing, I want to talk about some of the technology based around recordings. Um, in 1925, Columbia invented the first analog magnetic tape recorder, and this was a big, clunky, expensive machine. And uh, it actually worked by taking impulses of sound and being able to turn them into magnetic magnetic fields that uh, that change the magnetic tape so that when it's played back, you can reproduce the sound. And this is great and all, but what really was really cool in the 60s is a researcher named Tom Stockham from MIT began creating digital audio recordings and uh, he was actually using 16-bit, which is still one of the standards today, which is kind of impressive. The cool thing about making the change to digital audio recordings is that we were able to implement them on computers now. And so over the years, we've seen things such as digital audio workstations, which are like recording programs, software suites, and MIDI and other things really take over how sound, is, uh, how sound works nowadays. And this is great and all, but there were some problems when this shift happened. Uh, before, we classically had recording engineers working in the studio with these big machines that had lots of experience over the years on how to make a sound, how to shape a sound so that it sounds exactly like you want. But when we made the shift to computers, we gave the average musician and at-home recording musician the ability to make their own recordings, and there was a lack of knowledge. 
that uh, the recording engineers had. So this lack of experience led to poor technique. Um, and the real idea of recording is to get a good recording. But the definition of a good recording is kind of up in the air because it's an art form. So a lot of people will say that if you make something that doesn't quite sound good, it's still artistic and that's what you were going for. But there are certain qualities to a recording that we want. Uh, the scope of my project is to define where a microphone should be placed in order to get the proper spectral qualities of the recording that you want. <coughs> so back to what is a good recording. Uh, if recording is an art form, there should be no definition of what good is. But there are some qualities that we are considering. Uh, there's the SNR, which is signal to noise ratio, which is a common term in electrical engineering. And it, uh, it talks about the amount of signal you have compared to the noise that your microphone, in this case, is also picking up. And the two get mixed together. Also, there's the total harmonic distortion, which is brought upon by all the electronics that it passes through. And there's also frequency balance. Since our ears hear higher frequencies easier than they hear lower frequencies, it's important to pick up the higher frequencies at a much lower value than the lower frequencies, so that it sounds balanced to our ears. <coughs> so I'm focusing on the placement of a microphone, which shapes all those characteristics I just talked about, the SNR and also the frequency balance. And my proposal is to have a system that works so that you can record a location of a microphone, so that you can monitor where the microphone <coughs> is in a room when you're making these different recordings. And then after you make these recordings, be able to analyze the data, and at the end, be able to tell which location was the optimal place to put the microphone so that you get the best quality recording. So it works by placing a microphone in a certain area, and then the system takes down the data of x, y, and z coordinates of where the microphone is in the studio. Then you start the recording and save it, and then the microphone is moved to another place, and you continue to loop for a certain amount of readings. Then the information is sent to a computer where it's transferred into the spectrum, uh, into the frequency spectrum, and then you can optimize it from there. So this is really advantageous for recording and home recording for uh, unexperienced musicians because they don't have all the knowledge of where to place a microphone relative to where an instrument is being played, and things like that. So uh, my system that I designed has to meet certain marketing requirements. <coughs> uh, I call it the microphone positioning system. And oh, that's supposed to say MPS. That's the uh, but the overall aspects of the system is that it should be compatible with various sound sources because you don't know exactly what instrument you're going to be playing. Uh, you might be miking a uh, grand piano one day or somebody singing another day. So it has to work with those. It has to be inexpensive because at-home recording musicians don't have a lot of dough, so they're not going to want to pay a whole bunch for a system like this. And the rangefinder has to be able to give X, Y, and Z readings so that you can reproduce the location of the microphone that you had previously. Uh, there's also going to be a transmitter that clips onto the microphone stand, and this is what's taking the readings of X, Y, and Z. It has to work uh, from 2 inches up to 165 feet. I came up with that number after looking at the various range finding schemes. Uh, it needs to be wireless because you can't be running power and all these cables to it while you're moving the system around because it would just get too scattered and clunky. And it also has to have a resolution, a uh, very high resolution of two inches because when you record, anything between two inches isn't going to change the spectrum very much. So that's the resolution I came up with. Uh, also, there's a microcontroller that, co that powers, or that controls the thing, and the uh, power is supplied by batteries. Yeah. Uh, one question. Is the idea here that, uh, let's say that even a room, uh, mm -hmm. going to different locations, uh, things could be different because of the acoustic effect and all of yeah. that? Yeah. yeah, so any every room changes acoustically. So when you're trying to find a position to put a microphone in, it'll be picking up different frequencies from all the reflections around. 
and there are some places where the frequencies aren't balanced and we wouldn't like to record in these positions. So this system will tell you what the sweet points pretty much of a room are. So if you record here, you'll get a good balance of frequencies. Now, I'm very sorry, if you don't mind, could you please hold on to the question until he's done the 20 yeah, minutes speech time? You yeah, I forgot, that. sorry. No problem. <laughs> and so the next there's going to be a software portion uh, that helps the inexperienced recording musician interpret the frequency spectra data. And it's going to hold uh, 20 plus readings. And the recordings are read straight from the sound card into a program called LabVIEW. Then it's imported into MATLAB where I do my processing and analysis of the signal. Also, for the posi positioning system, I'm going to be using beacons, which uh, are two cylindrical pylons. If you look on page three of your handout, there's a description of the pylons that I'm going to be using. Since the shape of a room is always changing that you record in, it's really important that this system be independent of the size and shape of the room. So I'm using these two beacons to be able to triangulate the microphone position in any room. Uh, since I'm going to be reflecting things off them and that's how I'm going to be taking my measurements, they have to be reflective to certain qualities. If I'm using laser, they need to be reflective to laser. If they're sound, they need to be sound reflective. And since I'm planning on using laser technology, I'm going to be making them out of mylar, which is, has a high reflectivity, so that my readings will be very accurate. And also, some of the engineering requirements I'm using, I'm going to be using Zigbee technology for the wireless transmission of my data points. And uh, these are some of the statistic or the uh, specifications. The frequency band I'm going to be using is 2.4 gigahertz and power consumption and so forth. And these uh, Zigbee transceivers actually have a really high range of one mile, which is great because in a recording studio you probably aren't recording something a mile away. And the measurements I'm going to be making on the frequency spectrum have 400 readings. Uh, they need to range from 10 hertz to 20 kilohertz <coughs> and so forth. And the X, Y, and Z coordinates need to have an accuracy of two inches, as I speak before. So why would you want to use an MPS? <coughs> it is true that you could move a microphone to different locations and you could get lucky with uh, the spectral quality that you pick up. But this system makes finding that spot a lot simpler. Uh, before you would have to take a mic and move it and then record and then walk back to the mic and record and you'd have to look at the spectrum all by yourself and figure it out yourself. But this automates the process pretty much. And also, you don't need to have any learning of the acoustics of a room or any advanced things like that. You can just use this system and it'll be able to tell you what you need. So the target customers for this are inexperienced recording musicians because they, don't, they lack the knowledge of, uh, of recording techniques. And also, a studio with small staff would be able to utilize this product because they don't have a lot of manpower to move all these things around and keep all keep all these variables together. Uh, and even possibly acoustic researchers could use it, or architects that are interested in sound design, or sound reinforcement, noise cancellation, things like that. So now I'm going to talk about how the positioning system works. Uh, the basic process is, we in the top left we have a range finder, which communicates with the pylons, which are my beacons and I'm going to reflect a signal off of that. Using that signal, I can measure the distance from each pylon. And since I have three readings, I know that the distance between the two pylons is fixed. I have three values that I can triangulate the location of the uh, microphone. And then these calculated values are sent to a Zigbee transmitter, uh, which is connected to the UART of the microprocessor. This transmitter sends out a wireless signal that is received to a Zigbee receiver that's connected to the computer through a microprocessor. This is connected to the microprocessor again through the UART. And the X, Y, and Z and the I value, which is what reading number you're on, are all transmitted through the RS-232 port of the computer. Uh, the possible technologies that I researched for the rangefinder, uh, I looked into laser, ultrasonic, and GPS. And they all have pros and cons, but when it came down to it, the laser rangefinder was the most acceptable for this project.
So for the rangefinder, some of the some of the pros of ultrasonic were that it's cheap and it's very small, but some of the cons were that the focusing of the the pulse that's sent out isn't accurate enough to reflect off these pylons. So if I have objects in the room, it might be getting reflected off of this perhaps, and that will come up as an inaccurate reading. So I decided to go with laser technology because it's relatively cheap and it's very accurate, but one of the cons is it's a very uh, technical and complex system. So creating one of those on my own would be a project in itself, really. <coughs> so the way the microprocessor, which is the brain of the system, is going to work is when you start up the system, you're going to have this LED display, and to the right of it is the display example that shows you what the screen is going to look like. You're going to have your distance one, which is the distance between the two pylons, which is fixed to 10 feet. Then with the push buttons that are connected to the microcontroller, you're going to be able to make readings through the laser rangefinder. So the reading one will be the distance to the pylon one, and then reading two will be the distance to the pylon two, three will be to the ground. So we have x, y, and z coordinates, and we can reproduce those. Then using the triangulation that I talked about before, we'll be able to come up with x, y, and z coordinates with relation to the first pylon. That way, when we want to go back and move the microphone to a certain position, all we have to do is move it to X, Y, and Z. Also, there's a I, which is the count for what reading you're doing. So if you want to make 20 readings, the last reading will be 20. The software that I'm planning on using uh, are LabVIEW and MATLAB. The LabVIEW is going to be used to connect uh, it's going to be connected through the USB audio interface and the audio sample that I'm taking is going to be run into LabVIEW and saved as a .wav file. This file is then going to be imported into MATLAB using the wave read function that's internal to MATLAB. And then MATLAB is going to be able to take the fast Fourier transform of this which changes it into the frequency spectrum and then once we have this frequency spectrum data we can analyze the whole recording. Once I get these frequency spectrum plots, I'm going to be analyzing them using two of the topics I talked about earlier. Signal to noise ratio, uh, it's going to measure the peaks of the harmonics of the signal, and it's also going to compare them to the noise that is found in the signal, and it's going to give a rating. Also, the pink noise correlation, since our ears hear higher frequency is louder, the natural recording scheme that we follow is to have a high amplitude in the lower regions and have it roll off towards the, the higher frequencies. So I'm going to have a function that represents the pink noise, and I'm going to take the correlation of my recording to the frequency spectrum of my recording and correlate it with the pink noise. And that way, the <coughs> result with the highest amplitude will be the optimal pink noise position. The first test that I did uh, was to make sure that the theory worked behind this. I tested the frequency spot the response versus a location. So for the first reading, I had a sound source which, which was just speakers, and I sent uh, A, which is 220 hertz signal, through these speakers, and I had the microphone eight inches away directly in front. So when I recorded it and converted it to the frequency spectrum, you can see that 220 hertz is the fundamental frequency, and then you have all the overtones after that. So I measured the values of these overtones, 220 and 440 and all the, the rest, and the decibel readings were also found. So after I took that and made this table, I moved the microphone uh, eight inches to the left and made the same recording. So I played the same pulse, and this is the recording that I got. It was actually interesting that moving it only eight inches was able to change the data that much. At first glance, it doesn't look that much different, but as you can see, this follows the pink noise guide a lot better than the one to the right, and also there's distortion in the harmonics. So using this information, I would be able to decide that this location is the one that I want to put my 
microphone in as comparable to the other one. And the second test that I did was to make sure that my theory of triangulation was correct. I used a laser rangefinder, which I purchased at Home Depot. It's actually a pretty cool device. Um, it's got a little laser on it, and you can take a reading. And I'm actually 215 inches from the wall right now. That's cool. <coughs> so I took that device, and I placed it at the first position. And I made my reading to target one, which were actually pieces of paper that I'd uh, drawn a crosshair on and taped to the wall. I knew that these, I also did the same thing for this one. And I knew the distance between the two was 64 inches. So I made a reading to this target from the location and to that target from the location. And I repeated this process for all the different locations that I have here. And what I was able to find was that my calculations that I did were uh, within an error of 5%, which was actually really cool. The budget for my system that I proposed, I originally wanted to keep it under a $200 range, but that didn't really work out. I guess I was just uh, dreaming. So when I looked at it in more detail, it's going to be around a $550 range, and that's including all the software and all the devices and all the miscellaneous <coughs> cables and connectors and things like that. And this is still more expensive than I thought I was going to originally be spending, but the similar spectrum analysis devices that people use in recording situations are upwards of thousands of dollars. So this system is actually really cheap when you compare it to the mobile systems that they already make. And it gives a little more detail that people are interested in. So the possible risks of this pro project are time constraints. It's a very large project that I'm working on by myself, but uh, I'm very passionate about this subject, so I don't see any problem spending uh, as much time as I can to get the project working. Uh, also, it's a very, uh, very large project that has multiple components. So that, again, is going to make it a lot more time consuming. So I'll be planning to spend a lot of all-nighters next semester. Uh, and also the analysis accuracy. These are theoretical uh, analyses that I'm coming up with by myself. So I'm not sure that the analysis is going to be as accurate as I would like. But theoretically, so far, everything's falling into place. And also the laser rangefinder interface. For me to interface with this device, there's really no uh, technical documents online that I can work with, so it's going to be completely up to me to solve that problem. But uh, I've also uh, realized that there are other ways to do it, that I can take a reading and type it in <laughs> to the microcontroller and have the human be the interface. There's a lot of ideas for that. And so my schedule, uh, what's next for the project? <coughs> I'm for the next winter break and first couple of weeks of school. I'm going to be completing my document portfolio, which uh, is a technical listing of all the supporting documents and research that I've done. After that, I'm going to design. I'm going to program the microcontroller so that the MPS user input uh, is ready to go, and I can actually. It won't be taking readings, but the whole system and the process will be able to go through. And then after that, the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be writing a VI for recording the wave through, waveform through a raw USB device, which is a really common move in LabVIEW, and there's a lot of support online for that, so that hopefully will be uh, not that difficult. Uh, and then also, I'm going to, after that, program the microcontroller to seriously, serially transmit the collected data points through the, the ZigBee transmitter and receive them also. And this is a list of some of the references that I used. Uh, National Instruments has a lot of forums, and MATLAB Central, and other recording books and things like that. So for now, I'd like to open up to any questions. Hopefully I have answers. Great. Uh, before uh, you ask questions, I gave one of these forms to everyone, especially all the faculty members. And 
So if you don't mind, please, just let me have this by the end of the presentation. Also, for students who are here, there's a sign-up sheet. Please make sure you sign it. So if anyone has not signed it, make sure you do it. Later. So, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, in uh, recording music, uh, basically you have uh, autos of uh, frequencies, harmonics, and so forth. Now, uh, for somebody like, for example, myself, if mm -hmm. I wanted to tune to a certain frequency, I don't know what would make the best recording. Mm -hmm. So, um, this is really like an art. Mm -hmm. So, I'd like to know what you did in that area. Uh, as far How as identify the best uh, sort of frequencies so that your project works for that mm -hmm. identify well naturally we know uh, there's been research in <laughs> psychoacoustics which is basically a mixture of psychology and acoustics so it's how the brain processes music uh, and audio so we know that the human ear can hear from a span of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz and in some cases it can be a little larger there's some people that are built with better ears but when you're playing an instrument and there's a composition of all frequencies. So acoustic instruments aren't exactly one frequency. They're not like a signal generator. They have, they're not as efficient and the body will move at different frequencies. So when you have a composition of all these frequencies, uh, let me go back to that slide. Here, this recording. So since I'm actually telling a synthesizer to play one note, but since it's going through the speakers, all these overtones come out. And the importance is not what these frequencies are, but it's that they follow the psychology that we know of acoustics. So as long as they follow this roll-off towards the higher frequencies,
Ja,